Luxury cars, yachts and even Michael Jackson memorabilia. The son of the president of Equatorial Guinea is on trial in France for misusing state funds to support a lavish global lifestyle. So what's behind this crackdown? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Laura Kyle. He's accused of widespread corruption and money laundering in Equatorial Guinea, but he's being tried for it almost everywhere else. Vice President Theodorin Obiang has been prosecuted in the US, is being investigated in Switzerland and now being tried in absentia in France. He's the son of Equatorial Guinea's leader and he's known for his enjoyment of luxury cars, mansions and expensive works of art. French prosecutors say all that property has been bought using illegal money, most of it in cash. They say Obiang stole $115 million from the government whilst he was agriculture minister from 2004 to 2011. During that time, he levied a tax on wood sales in Equatorial Guinea. French prosecutors say Obiang used proceeds from that tax for his personal spending. They're specifically trying him for property he bought in France, including a Parisian villa worth more than $100 million. Obiang has always said he earned his money legally, a point his lawyer repeated at the trial this week. What Mr Obiang did in his country was perfectly legal. All the jurisdictions where his case was studied, including the US, have realised this. This trial was made possible only in France through an intellectual creation that we will contest in court. Well, let's now get the thoughts of our guest in Paris. We have Florent Gilles. He's Africa Director at the International Federation for Human Rights. In Nairobi, Ali Khan Satu, an economist focusing on emerging markets. And in London, Andy Goldman, former senior Africa analyst with the Economist Intelligence Unit, now an African affairs specialist. Welcome, all of you. Thanks for being here with us on Inside Story. Anthony, if I could start with you, this really is an extraordinary shopping spree. Obiang is said to have had a compulsion to spend. Give us an idea of its full scope. Yeah, I think certainly, I think what attracts the eye with this one is this level of conspicuous consumption. I mean, it does conjure up all the images you might have of a clown prince, if you like. This is someone who's uh, got a couple of uh, uh, mega yachts, uh, properties in Malibu, um, uh, a record label that he uh, tinkered with uh, as a younger man, um, properties across Europe, fancy cars, nightclubs, you know, the, the full the full scale of bling and I think that it's that level of, of kind of conspicuous consumption that has generated a level of interest even above the actual sums of money which have disappeared which are also quite eye-watering. Ali Khan, as Anthony says, I mean, Obiang's been hardly subtle about his spending. We talk about bling, we can look at Michael Jackson's crystal glove to back up that word. I mean, why is it only now that action is being taken? How has he got away with it? It's incredible, isn't it? I think, you know, the, the, my takeaway is that President Hollande, in the twilight of his presidential term, is seriously trying to move the dial. Um, and I think we've got to look at it in the, in the French context that this is being now pushed in the French courts. It's an egregious example. It's obscene. It's impunity gone crazy. I mean, you couldn't make this up. And really, if we are going to do something about corruption in Africa, then this was a case that was so far above the radar, you couldn't miss it. And I think in that respect, you know, I really have to commend the president for making this move. I think it, it also speaks to a different environment globally in the financial markets, a more coercive, intrusive environment where you can't just take bucket loads of cash and expect to go and spend it anywhere in the Western world. So overall, I think, you know, this is an egregious example of corruption. And I think it's absolutely uh, a commendable action by the French. Floral, how difficult was it to get this trial up and running? Because I believe it took a decade of lobbying by anti-corruption groups. Yes, of course, it's very important for, for us as this kind of uh, trial. And it's the first one. There is another um, a series of uh, other trials targeting other African leaders in, uh, in Paris by the anti-corruption uh, uh, prosecutor. 
And so um, the example of uh, Equatorial Guinea is uh, quite expressive of uh, the massive corruption and the massive uh, uh, misappropriation of uh, public fund used and reinvested in the in in the French uh, uh, economy, and that's why it's so important for us also to have this uh, trial and this uh, expression of the non-complicity of uh, uh, the French society and the, the French authorities mm. in the such massive uh, misappropriation of uh, public fund, especially because I, I, I recall you that the, the half of the population of the 800,000 of uh, uh, inhabitants in Equatorial Guinea are still living under the uh, under poverty. So uh, these funds have to be used to develop the country and not just to to pay for luxury and uh, palace in, in, in Paris, even if it's in France. Mm. Certainly, we'll look at the impact it's had on Equatorial Guinea, the amount of money that Obiang has been spending. But first of all, just tell us, Florent, how he tried to block this trial. He and his lawyer tried very hard, didn't they? Yeah. First, first of all, we have to, to express the fact that um, the complaint have been filed in 2007. Mm. And from this time, the former president, uh, uh, the French president uh, Sarkozy, and the judiciary was not very uh, for this kind of uh, complaint and, uh, and legal procedure. So this, they tried to stop it and they tried to, uh, uh, to block it. Um, since few years, and especially uh, with the, the, the new or elected president uh, uh, Hollande, um, the, the fight was deblocked, and uh, uh, Obiang have been ch formally charged in 2040. But from all those years, from almost 10 years, um, the lawyers of uh, Obiang try to uh, uh, to block the procedure, and they used a very uh, a real. Uh, a legal guerrilla in a way. Uh, they, they even been uh, before the, the, the International Court of Justice mm. saying that uh, the goods uh, and the palace in France was uh, diplomatic uh, 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 buildings and uh, other uh, aspects. So it's also uh, a fight again for the independence of the French legal system that is complained uh, and this file. Uh, uh, was a, um, a kind of uh, expression. We'll come back to look more at the trial, what might come out of it just a little later in the programme. First of all, Anthony, I want to look at the impact it's had in country on Equatorial Guinea. I've got a report here from Global Witness saying that Obiang bought one super yacht for $380 million and that that is three times the country's health and education budget. I mean, when you put it in those terms, it's really very tragic. Well, look, it's extraordinary how quickly the economy in formal terms in Equatorial Guinea has grown over the last uh, 25 years or so since the discovery of oil. I mean, the first time that I visited the country, uh, just introduced its first ever telephone directory. It was three pages long and listed the few subscribers by their first name. It was possible in those days more or less to lean out the window and shout to whoever you wanted to speak to in the city because it was that quiet. Uh, the discovery of oil in 1992 and then in truly commercial terms in uh, three, three years later opened up an absolutely extraordinary uh, revolution in public finances in Equatorial Guinea, a country that really lacked any of the capacity at that time to manage the amount of funds that were coming in, not just into oil and gas, but then as the rest of the public administration was swamped. And I think that, you know, that uh, the, the, if you like the, the, the symbol of that, the, this kind of blurring of the lines between what was properly uh, belonged to government and what belonged to individuals in government, I think has been there right from the beginning. Uh, uh, Teodoro Obiang Gamer, uh, you know, uh, educated overseas, I'm, uh, I'm sure able in, in, in many ways, but it's impossible to escape the conclusion that his capacity to rise in government in Equatorial Guinea was driven principally, as in perhaps by his brother also, by their uh, family connections and the relationship they had with their father. That's how they got into these positions, were able to execute some of their contracts. But also, I think, because of that background of poverty in Equatorial Guinea, there was really no mechanism mm. to, to clarify this distinction between what properly belonged to the state and what properly belonged 
to individuals. And uh, when uh, Thierry went to court in South Africa some years ago, when he was challenged over excess uh, spending, he pointed out in an affidavit that there was no bar in Equatorial Guinea to ministers receiving commissions uh, for uh, f facilitating the execution of contracts by, by foreign partners. So I think that this idea that actually the law in Equatorial Guinea is slightly different, out of step with the rest of the world, certainly has some validity. But it's very clear that even in a very small country like Equatorial Guinea, and in terms of population, in terms of size, in terms of infrastructure, it really would have been possible with the amount of money that has come in to have revolutionized the lives of all of the people in the country, not just you know, a handful of the most well-connected who have enjoyed, as you say, a disproportionate uh, level of benefit and are able to buy uh, yachts and uh, uh, magnificent mansions in Europe and the US while uh, the body of the population have received, relatively speaking, almost no benefit from this extraordinary dividend that the country has enjoyed over the last generation. Florent, given the lack of mechanisms that Anthony was just talking about there, how quickly Equatorial Guinea amassed its fortunes as a country, does Obiang's defence team have a case when it says that it obtained its money illegally? Uh, sorry, legally. Um, it's almost 110 <coughs> millions of euro that formally came from the national treasury of uh, Equatorial Guinea to the personal account of the uh, uh, vice president of uh, Equatorial Guinea that is also the son of the uh, uh, current president. Um, you have to remember also that uh, the president Obiang is uh, uh, in charge and at power from uh, uh, now for uh, uh, 35 years. Um, so this is a, a kind of uh, dict dictator, a soft dictator, of course, mm. because uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, billion and billion of, uh, the, uh, of dead, but there is a, a real system established to keep under pressure the opposition. There is only a one uh, uh, chairman, uh, the, the opposition uh, as a deputy uh, to the National Assembly. Um, there is no re real uh, civil society organization. Uh, they, uh, all the opponents and all people, there is not a r real free speech, uh, liberty of press. Um, so this country is, of course, quite developed regarding uh, uh, other country of the area and the uh, Central African Republic. But it's also, um, you know, like uh, the expression of uh, how a so rich country have been used to the personal purpose of a clan, because the family, the Obiang family, is a clan, and uh, how the 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 misappropriation of billions uh, of uh, euros have been used uh, for personal purpose, and this is quite uh, uh, amazing. But we have also to. Uh, Note that there is uh, arbitrary detentions mm. and the use of torture still in the prison of uh, Equatorial Guinea. So it's not s totally the soft dictator that we can imagine. And of course, the people, even if they have some um, economic behavior, they also need the political and civil and political rights. And, uh, um, most of the Equatorial Guinean uh, persons that you can uh, meet need also this, uh, this freedom. Sure. Uh, Ali Khan, so do you see, a, the, just, just to jump in, just, a, I want to see uh, an idea from Ali Khan perhaps as to whether this trial is likely to have any positive impact in Equatorial Guinea. You know, Equatorial Guinea is the King Leopold model of an economy where you privatize a country's assets and you basically suppress the population. And if you want an example of a rentier state, books have been written about this across the continent. The last one I read was the looting machine. This is a looting machine. And it is not even very subtle. I mean, it is incredible that these kinds of amounts swung around the banking system. And I think you know, we've, what we're seeing is a line being drawn. Now, the question is, he is probably correct. There is no law. Mm. Obiang's law is what counts in Equatorial Guinea. The law is what he's going to choose to say it is. So, in effect, nothing is ever going to happen within country. It has to happen externally. The question is, will this external pressure change behavior in these sorts of countries? And just to contextualize what has happened in Equatorial Guinea, population of less than a million, 
you've had an average per capita GDP of $20,000. It's not half the population that's below the poverty line. Last estimates I saw, it's 72%. Mm. So you've got an extraordinary situation and that needs to change. The question is, how is it going to change? And I think this is a positive step in the direction of change. If these folks can't spend their money in the Cote d'Azur or, or, or buying Michael Jackson's glove, externally, it's going to be more and more difficult for them to operate. So I think that's the positive. But make no mistake, you know, we have this problem in many parts of African countries where you capture the state, you own the state, the money that creation is so exponential, you dwarf what's left in the national treasury. You can buy and win elections and say, I won it by 90%, which seems to be the magic number in Equatorial yeah. Guinea. But, you know, if there was a free election, he would be gone. Mm. So that's the point. And how do we change those circumstances and create a better life for people that, that really deserve it? OK, well, let's just use this opportunity to widen the picture just a little bit, because Transparency International says every country does have some degree of corruption, but the problem does appear to be particularly prevalent in African countries. Six of the ten most corrupt countries in the world, according to Transparency's index, are in Africa, and French authorities have taken it upon themselves to prosecute several of their leaders. In 2013, police raided the Nice home of former Gab Gabonese president Omar Bongo Ondimba. They say he bought the villa with stolen money. Now, they've also investigated President Denis Sassou Nguesso from the Republic of Congo. These trials are a major shift in French policy, as we've been hearing, which has long ignored corrupt African leaders who buy Parisian property. And France is, in fact, said to control a majority of the national reserves of 14 African countries, including Equatorial Guinea, Gabon and the Republic of Congo. And see, it's a slightly different slanted question here. I mean, how do African nations feel about France investigating their leaders? Does it bring up any feelings of resentment that these trials are being held outside of their country by former colonial power? I think it does spark some uh, concern on the part of some of the governments uh, in the region, perhaps slightly less so on the part of some of the ordinary people in those, gov in those countries which have seen public finances abused and looted in the way that they've been where there are issues over the capacity of the judiciary in some of those countries independently to investigate some of these issues and make no mistake it is very difficult in country to, to look at some of these issues uh, mm. even in some of the most developed countries like South Africa you know when you have the whole force of the state against you it's asking a lot of an independent judiciary to take on some of those vested interests we've seen uh, in Nigeria, for example, where maybe you know, in terms of raw amounts of money, huge amounts have left. It's very, very difficult actually to be able to get a handle on that by the local investigating authorities. I think when you see, for in, for example, uh, Congo, uh, U.S. hedge funds uh, settling uh, cases, admitting that they have paid very large sums of money to senior public officials, I think it's an indication of the challenge that countries in Africa may be faced to begin to look at some of these things. But also, I suspect it raises the issue of, of burden sharing. The element to which you know, that the bribes are not just receive, uh, received, they're also offered, and the money then is also uh, tied it up outside. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about um, luxury yachts and uh, fabulous properties, somebody uh, in a developed country is taking in cash uh, sums of money for a transaction without it being very clear where that has come from. And in an age where you know, due diligence and compliance are meant to uh, be issues that uh, set an, a, a standard of uh, how transactions are conducted, I think it does raise issues uh, not just over the extent to which uh, uh, crimes are committed uh, in Central Africa or other parts of the continent, but which those crimes are facilitated and perhaps in a sense also encouraged by investors looking to take shortcuts. And then on the retail side, uh, people looking to dispose of uh, high value, high net worth uh, goods who perhaps have much less interest in where the money has come from to purchase those okay. goods than is altogether healthy. That's a really interesting point. Florent, do you think that's going to come up in the trial, that not only the people who are spending this money, Obiang, but the people who've been receiving it, the owners of the supiots, the owners of the houses, are they going to be under the spotlight too? Um, yeah, it's not, um, it's not so easy because there, there is also uh, something that uh, it's very important to know is that the, the French banks' uh, system have been involved uh, also in the, in the Obiang uh, system predation. And we have also, um, this express also the complicity of uh, the, the different uh, Western bank and uh, the financial system that is used 
um, to uh, the misappropriation of uh, uh, those public funds. So um, there is a, a, a huge um, a complicity uh, system that have been to, uh, to expand, and I totally agree uh, of the fact that uh, this is very important to, uh, uh, to develop uh, a clear assessment of uh, those networks first. And secondly, for Africa, it's absolutely uh, necessary that the transparency and the control of uh, public funds, it's absolutely necessary for the development of uh, democracy uh, mm. uh, itself. And um, this check and balance that is uh, used, you, you see in Africa that uh, the civil society try to develop a such control on the use of public funds, but also it's, this is a fight uh, are for democracy that we are uh, urging to. So uh, there is a huge link that have to be uh, developed and uh, this is not a, a lost uh, fight, of course mm. not. Uh, for more than 10 years now, there is a check and balances used by the, the civil society to develop uh, uh, a, a new way of uh, fighting against um, the oppression and uh, also um, the, um, the captation and the predation of public funds, but also the predation of, okay. the, of the power. So um, we have to, 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 to think about that uh, globally, uh, also with the link of the former com colonies, of course, sure. but also uh, with the, 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 the energy of the, of, uh, of the continent. Uh, Ali Khan, it's one thing, isn't it, to seize all these assets. It's quite another thing to get the money back into the country. Is it possible to repatriate any of the assets to Equatorial Guinea? Well, we've seen a number of instances where money has been repatriated. Mm. There's been a recent example in Kenya where commissions were paid into some offshore accounts and that money's been repatriated. But what I'm finding increasingly is countries doing the repatriation are trying to control how that money is spent and are looking to make sure that it's put to good use and just doesn't do a, a round trip back in and mm. back out again in some shape or form. So I think there's much more scrutiny as to, you know, I, so I think it can be repatriated. I'm not sure it can be repatriated under the current regime because if you listen to what they're saying and how they're behaving, um, you can see that they see this as, a, as an enormous affront on their sovereignty. Sovereignty is always an, a, a nice term that our leaders like to throw out there. But really, if, I think people on the ground would be commending what the French courts have done. And that sovereignty argument does not work further than the halls of the African Union, I'm afraid. A couple of final points I would just like to throw in there. Of course, it was ExxonMobil who found this just oil quickly. there in the 1995. Tillerson, who was this... Tillerson, who was the CEO of ExxonMobil, is now the Secretary of State. And one wonders whether this sort of oligarchic model that you see from Russia, from Equatorial Guinea, is something that Africa has to look forward to, not much, obviously, under the new stewardship of the Donald Trump administration. Because what's happened in Equatorial Guinea has happened under ExxonMobil's watch. Anthony, one last quick question, last 30 seconds. Are the days of the finer things now over for Obiang? Well, the, uh, the, uh, Obiang has uh, won an election only last year. He's made his son, uh, the, uh, now under investigation in, uh, in, in France, his heir apparent as uh, vice president. It's certainly going to be awkward for him as a minister, maybe one day as president, to travel in the way the president uh, might. But uh, it really needs a revolution mm. in Equatorial Guinea in terms of values to see how this government, how the, the, the clan is going to lo lo lose its authority in any hurry. OK, fantastic to speak to you all. Very, very interesting indeed to explore this subject further. Thanks very much for joining us. Florent Gilles, Hi. Ali Khan Satchu and Anthony Goldman. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle and the whole team here. Bye for now.